I'm Matt at Nexus Baseball, and this is episode 50 of the Tommy John Epidemic. This series is a YouTube read of content from the book Plague of the Gods, an outsider's perspective on baseball's Tommy John Epidemic, which is available now on Amazon. I decided to put this content on YouTube to make the material as accessible as possible. The series examines the science behind the most superhuman action the human body can produce, accelerating a baseball up to 100 miles per hour. Currently as the system exists, with minimally qualified instruction at lower levels, kids either get it intuitively or leave the sport, with the drop-off in participation at the high school level significant. It is at this level that kids that have mostly naturally developed the techniques required to hit, pitch, and field start to create the largest separation in skill level, and many kids simply can't compete and are left behind. Progressive leveling in-house league teams would significantly assist with this. For example, it would allow the 14-year-old that throws and hits comparable to a 12-year-old to compete with kids at his own level of development. This would aid retention in the sport, as well as give more ability for late joiners and bloomers to stay with the sport and succeed. Anyone that has worked with children realizes that, particularly during the teenage years, puberty is not linear, and there is often only a small correlation between age, size, and skill level. The 6 foot 2 inch kid that throws 80 miles per hour at 14 should be playing up while the kid that is still under 5 feet entering high school should be playing down. Kids that have birthdays later in the year are massively disadvantaged in strictly age-based systems, as often there is a gap of almost a year between their age and that of their peers that have earlier birthdays. In keeping with this theme, particularly for pitching, it would be greatly advantageous to have a greater diversity of mound distances based on level to allow developing pitchers to mature into the distances in a more progressive fashion. For example, both 8 and 12 year olds usually throw from the same 47 foot distance mound, but with often wildly different size and strength levels. This makes lollipop pitches common at younger ages, teaching poor mechanics and release points. As the kids, and less naturally gifted, cannot usually throw a ball straight at those ages and distances. The child's hands are simply too small to get a grip on a standard baseball to provide the pressure necessary to create any sort of backspin. Instead, if an 8-year-old, or equivalent tiered skill level in a progressive system described, were to throw from 42 feet 6 inches, the minimum safe distance to allow for reaction time from a hit ball, and 2 feet of distance were added per year or skill level until the age of 18 and the 60 foot 6 inch regulation distance was achieved, pitchers would be able to much more effectively generate arm strength and release point relative to their age and skill level. This would be achievable on any field with a standard full-size mound and would just require kids to throw on flat ground until they tapered up the front of the mound. This would also be ideal as it would teach proper mechanics on flat ground to younger children without the complication of the mound before adding in a gradual elevation increase from age 13 to 18 of approximately 2 inches per year. Movable pitching rubbers can be utilized until full distance as this too would teach pitchers to stand touching the rubber and not hooking it to push off like a jump. This could be combined with an online use tracking program for all a player's outings and practices. It could also contain each player's level and safety certifications that accompany it. Of course, other organizations are under no obligation to join or follow this league-sponsored program, but if it were listed as a requirement for draft eligibility, it would very quickly reach full compliance. This is in the same manner that while you don't have to take the SATs or equivalent standardized test, you can't apply for programs that require them. Major League Baseball, as obviously the highest level of the sport, is in a unique position to provide such standardization and make safety mandatory for participation. The cost of such a program would be minimal, as it would only be creating the requirements for participation, providing educational materials and rule enforcement, like the NCAA, and not the administration of the youth programs themselves. In contrast, MLB could provide a combination of free and at-cost training programs for coaches for coach certification that would have the goal of offsetting any costs of program administration. Standards of education in every case create better coaches and trainers. Just as you would want a personal trainer with some form of qualification, so should you want a qualified coach teaching your children. Baseball is already engaging in the sphere through their Pitch Smart program that teaches facts about Tommy John surgery to young pitchers and helps create pitch counts and rest standards for Little League. By implementing a standardized, safe, and progressive system to youth baseball, more children will stay with baseball as they grow up rather than dropping the sport. Progressive systems create measurable goals that allow kids to aspire to greater and create feelings of accomplishment for completion. The implementation of this system will also allow the draft to become more effective by doing a better job of ensuring that prospects have been better managed over their careers and reducing the chance of existing injuries going into the professional ranks. 
Teams will benefit from injury reduction and have an easier task of scouting talent by determining more easily a player's history throughout the development process. Without a system of enforced compliance, it is extremely hard to sell injury prevention. There will always be incentives to cheat to get ahead, but by providing greater obstacles to methods that compromise safety, the likelihood is reduced. Healthcare has shown that the difficulty in selling preventative medicine is human nature to wait for a problem to occur before dealing with it. By incentivizing before problems can arise, a lot of difficulty later in the process can ideally be prevented. But how can the obviously complex pitching motion be taught to children that invest a fraction of the time a professional pitcher would? Simplification and progression are the keys to development. Basic safety standards would in involve movement testing at the lowest levels to ensure that kids have the range of motion and stability to throw and hit the baseball safely. Children would have to demonstrate various motions that exemplify muscular control and stability to be able to first play and then to certify for play at higher levels. The higher the level generally, the larger and more powerful the participants, and the more the basics must be emphasized and then built on in terms of added complication. Consider these basic motions and stability drills, the kata, to borrow a term from karate, of the sport of baseball. These basic motions evolve into more elaborate skills drills that should be completed with proficiency and consistency before advancement to the next level of play. Topics for consideration include pitching mechanics as well as on-field skills like sliding and bunting. Too often, players will advance with significant holes in their game that go un uncorrected until a safety incident occurs. This process will help to ensure players have these skills prior to them becoming an issue. You wouldn't agree to have your child allowed into the deep end of the pool without the tested competency to do so safely, and this follows along that line of thought. When teaching techniques themselves, coaches and the programming should reference the basic anatomical movements from lower levels before adding complexity at each level by turning them into multi-step drills that reinforce safety concepts. By providing coaches with a consistent program tailored for their level of coaching and expertise, consistency between organizations is created, allowing for more fluid movement and collaboration between those organizations. Most importantly, it gives coaches, particularly those at the lowest levels, the confidence that they are providing quality instruction and not doing harm the foremost goal of any coach or trainer. Join me for episode 51 next week. Remember, if you like the content, please like and subscribe. Your support makes this work possible. Also, if you want to jump ahead, please consider picking up the book on Amazon from the link in the description below. See you next week.